Baba Yaga is a legend of Eastern folklore, and also a giallo film from 1973 directed by Corrado Farina. If you like Italian exploitation, you'll feel right at home with this movie. It's got a great score, one half orchestral melodrama, one half funky stuff. It's got a bunch of wacky cinematography, plenty of gratuitous nudity and violence, and a bunch of different highly provocative themes, ideas, images thrown in for good measure. Like a lot of Giallo films, this movie comes across as haphazardly constructed, uh, but it is a lot of fun to watch. Baba Yaga does not sit still. It is always throwing new ideas in your face, and the style is incredibly dynamic. It also has undercurrents of mystery and sexual intrigue that drive the film along, at least in theory. Since this movie is kind of all over the place, I won't try too hard to straighten everything out, but there are a lot of interesting themes and ideas that I want to talk about. Let me say first that this movie stars American actress Carol Baker as Baba Yaga, uh, French actress Isabel de Funes, and Italian actor George Eastman. No, that's not his given name. This film is from an era when virtually all Italian films were dubbed, which is one reason why international casts like this were so common. There seem to be two versions of this movie, at least, a full-length Italian cut and a shorter international cut that has been dubbed into English. The purist would say to watch the longer one, but really it probably doesn't matter that much for this movie. I watched um, the longer one. You can tell very clearly where uh, the, the, the scenes in the Italian, the, the scenes that were not included in the international one, the quality dropped significantly on the print that I had. Anyway, both of them are dubbed, so, you know, up to you. Uh, if you watch the shorter version of the film, you will miss an extremely odd opening scene that I'll talk about in a little bit. I think the shorter version is actually available on YouTube, so that might be the easiest. Baba Yaga is based on a series of comics by Guido Crepax called Valentina. The film is a fairly indirect adaptation. It's almost a multimedia project, really, with some still images, some comic like frames where the actors have sort of been drawn into a comic, uh, and of course a bunch of different live action ideas with some archival footage, some dream sequences, some films within films, uh, all kinds of stuff. I think you could make some points about how all these different modes connect to some of the big ideas uh, of the movie, but that's maybe a little bit of a stretch. Maybe this collage is fumbling towards some kind of early postmodernism. But really, I think the still frames don't give us a whole lot more than style. And the comic book angle is kind of cool, but it's also kind of peripheral. And you might not even really notice it if you don't research the film. Okay, I keep mentioning some big ideas in this movie. What are they? I think the most obvious theme is the relationship between art, politics, and markets. Not an uncommon theme, I guess. Corrado Farina actually did not direct very many films. He mainly did more corporate work, such as documentaries and commercials. Valentina, the main character of the film, is a commercial photographer. I don't think that's a coincidence. There's a lot of political talk in the film, but the conversations aren't about staging protests or registering voters. Instead, the subject is almost always how to reconcile revolutionary impulses with this corporate art world. Is it even possible to be an authentic artist, an authentic revolutionary, uh, who knows. Valentina, uh, her lover Arno, and others, they all do their best to balance radical politics with a commercial career, and yet they constantly find themselves interrogating each other, and maybe themselves, about it. In some ways, the enormous metaphorical conflict in the film could be interpreted as grappling with this issue. I think that is at least part of it. All the women in this film have enormous fur coats. I don't know enough about Italy to know exactly the legacy of the fur coat. They remind me a bit of 1950s Hollywood and also of fascism. I think we're supposed to understand these characters as having a somewhat conspicuous streak of luxury. Nice apartment, parties, a fairly loose lifestyle, which is somewhat at odds with serious political or artistic sacrifice and somewhat at odds with the bohemian personalities that they seem to take on. Of course, we see Valentina's work as an artist, 
uh, as well as our notes. We can make up our mind about it, I suppose. We see Valentina hosting various photo shoots at her studio apartment, mainly for cosmetics, latching onto vague iconography of the Wild West or of ancient Egypt. We see Arno filming a soap commercial. I'll come back to some of these things later on. It's notable how these artists flit in and out of various contexts, I guess. In the beginning of the movie, uh, if you've got the full-length version at least, we see some kind of American Indian fighting with some sort of Custer-like cavalry men. This is a fairly provocative way to start the film. Uh, you might say an exploitative way to start the film. Not totally out of line, I guess, with some of Italy's infamous faux historical films of the 60s. It turns out that this opening scene is, I guess, part of a movie that the pseudo-Bohemians are filming, or maybe it's part of some kind of political demonstration. For some reason, the uh, Indian has a megaphone, um, it's not exactly clear, uh, the ontology of the scene, what's, what's going on here exactly. But right after one of these Union soldiers has made a big speech about restoring law and order, one of the crew, one of the groupies, shouts out that the cops are coming, and everyone gets up and runs. Everyone disperses. Like I said, we see people flitting in and out of various incendiary contexts, pretending to be, uh... Indians uh, for a moment for, for some sort of vague political or commercial purpose. It's not exactly clear. Uh, you might put this together with the multimedia style of the film, all this flitting back and forth. Okay, I realize I've yet to say anything about Baba Yaga herself. Uh, I just want to touch on one more thing before we get to that. The fractured and contradictory ideas of most of the characters in the film are really brought out in a couple of scenes that uh, have to do with race. First, we see Valentina hosting a photo shoot with a white model and a black model, and she tells the black model to be as primitive as he can be, because that will apparently sell. It's brazen commercialization of race, and it's not entirely clear if Valentina is saying this as a critic or as a strategist. A little bit later, we see Arno filming a commercial. Actually, the film simply cuts right into the action, Again, making us wonder if someone changed the channel or something. It's filmed in the style of a 1930s gangster film, and a black man is being chased uh, on a bunch of shipping containers by a white man. The chase ends when the white guy throws soap onto the black guy, and he disappears. It's a, it's a soap commercial. Again, this is pretty brazen. Um, now, progressivism has changed down the years, and it's certainly possible that people could be bold advocates for economic change, uh, but not really care about civil rights. But these two moments are so on the nose that I think Corrado Farina is gesturing towards something. So is this a self-aware critique of so many exploitation films? Hmm. Or is it yet another exploitation film? Or is it both? Not only are there racial provocations and colonial skits, there are also some Nazi scenes. The movie reminds me a little bit of the Liliana Cavani film, The Night Porter, uh, which also remixes Nazi imagery in a fairly provocative way. Very interesting movie. Uh, came out the year after this one. Uh, this fascist provocation is not totally uncommon. It is pretty extreme, though. Um, for now, I guess I'll just say maybe it, it serves a similar role as some of the elements that I've just mentioned, flitting in and out of incendiary context as artists and as business people, I guess. Um, and the connection between that and this, this genre of exploitation. Uh, a more in-depth look at the fascist stuff could, could be interesting. Anyway, let's talk about Babi Yaga. Babi Yaga is a fairly common character in Eastern folklore. Babi Yaga shows up in tons of Russian fairy tales, for instance. Um, some people <laughs> might not be happy with my pronunciation, but I think that's a pretty common way to say it, in the U.S. at least. Uh, Baba Yaga is a witch, uh, but she isn't always entirely sinister, I guess. In the film, Valentina bumps into a woman who calls herself Baba Yaga after a late night accident. She's this stately woman in a big, in a big car who develops a certain type of attachment. Baba Yaga seems to seed Valentina with tormenting dreams, eventually drawing her to her crumbling mansion where the spell becomes even harder to break. In fairy tales, Baba Yaga often sets out challenges for young women, serving in some ways like a coming-of-age 
uh, ritual or a, a rite of passage, um, these challenges as an introduction to womanhood or something. And really, in some ways, this movie isn't that different. Now, I know a second ago I was talking about curses and tortured dreams, but I do think that there is a way in which this stuff is a challenge for Valentina, uh, a challenge to the somewhat haphazard personal and artistic life uh, that she has lived. At one point, Babiaga places a curse on Valentina's camera that seems to make it kill anyone that it photographs. Babiaga has seen Valentina's lifestyle and, I guess, asks the question, what would she be without her camera? What could she do? Would her ideals stand up? Now, for anyone who has read any classic film theory, uh, this is a great little subplot. Um, a lot of early film theory, I guess, was really fascinated with questions like, what is a camera? You know, it, it doesn't seem to be anything like a painting. What, what is this thing? What does it mean to take a picture? People were pretty confused about this for a while, it would seem. Coupled with this, there are a lot of movies that make a, dig, a big deal about the ontology of the photographic image. What exactly is a picture? Often by, you know, morphing together a camera with something else, by giving a camera strange properties or giving it strange powers, by allying it with some somewhat dissimilar object. And death also is often part of the story because one thing that a camera does is it stops time. And in a way, I guess, it's a killing machine. It's actually interesting that sort of separately from all this theory stuff, cameras and guns share a lot of the same terminology. You shoot things with a camera, for instance. Uh, maybe it's a, a cannon camera. Ooh. <laughs> maybe you're out on the street shooting run and gun style with your target in the crosshairs. You could really go on and on with this kind of thing. Um, this movie isn't exactly a bold new look on any of these stuff, but it's, it's tapping into a lot of pretty common ideas here with this cursed camera. This is pretty interesting. Um, and, and it also begs a more direct question about, about Valentina's art and her commercial work. Is it a force for good or is it somehow cursed? It reminds me a little bit of the film Blow Up, directed by Michelangelo Antonioni, uh, a, a really nice movie that I think is a bit more on the meaningful side of things and a bit less on the exploitation side of things, strongly recommend. In that movie, a photographer accidentally captures the aftermath of a murder uh, with his camera, and the crime somehow becomes bound up inextricably with his photographs. Uh, that's a movie with a lot of scenes in a dark room, just like, just like this one. In both, we seem to be fascinated by how an image can emerge out of nothing. These days, people aren't as attuned to the materiality of film. Images come and go so easily. It's so easy to capture something. Um, the materiality is not at the forefront anymore, but it's a big piece of more traditional photography, and it's kind of a strange process, kind of a magical process that feels a bit like sleuthing for a crime or investigating a curse, I suppose, a certain type of seance, the development of photos, the image emerging from silver halide. Um, so, you know, this stuff regarding the camera is kind of interesting. Like I said, it's, it's been done, um, but, but kind of cool. Um, like I said, Bobby Alga gives Valentina some deeply penetrating challenges. Maybe she is challenging some of the aforementioned inconsistencies of her life and her work. Um, of course, Bobby Alga is this old folkloric thing. It's an interesting question, too, why this sort of Russian Eastern folklore felt like a potent image for the film, if it's just some sort of vague, spooky, foreign legend, if there's some connection to the war time or something, unclear. Um, but, but like I said, folkloric. So maybe there's some sort of historical inflection to all this. Maybe Bobby Og is, in some extent, the gauntlet of tradition, and that's what's challenging Valentina. Or maybe it's a much more general idea of an artistic struggle, an artistic struggle struggle to be an activist or something as well, potentially. An artistic struggle where you're constantly feeling the pull of this alluring but torturous witch, constantly having her sabotage your work, your life, your thinking, constantly throwing a monkey wrench into everything, making you reevaluate and reposition. It's interesting, too, Valentina can't use her camera anymore. It becomes cursed. She, she has a backup or whatever. There's plenty of artists who 
are infatuated with a, a particular tool at one time, but for whatever reason, things change. Their art takes them elsewhere, and, and that tool falls by the wayside. They need new ideas from something else. Um, so maybe in some ways, being under the spell of this witch is what it's like to be an artist. Uh, or, or maybe in some ways, this constant challenge, this impossible balancing act of being a commercial artist, maybe that's uh, tied into it too. I think these are reasonable ways to, to think of the movie. Um, but so far, I haven't mentioned anything about sex, uh, which is really a huge part of the film. This connection between Baba Yaga and Valentina is romantic. Uh, it is sexual and it's fetishistic. Uh, here, the movie leans a bit more into exploitation territory, definitely. Um, a lot of what I've said, though, about this torturous allure of Baba Yaga, that, that still tracks, really. I guess the extreme nature of this element of the film hammers home how embodied these conflicts might be, how much questions of art and politics are questions of the body, how much this is a challenge to one's identity. Existential questions, the answers to which might involve total self-sacrifice. This pursuit for art, for, for whatever, is, is double-sided. It's compelling, but also dangerous. So that's one reading, but honestly, this movie is pretty unstable. So I don't know that we can really pin anything to it too firmly, but I do think that the vibe of Baba Yaga there and the idea of the artist trying to balance, trying to work, trying to find inspiration, that's interesting. That's interesting. That angle does depend on some level of ambivalence, though, towards Baba Yaga's literal torture of Valentina, right? And honestly, I'm not really sure how open-minded people were at the time. How, who knows? You know, Belle de Jour and the aforementioned The Night Porter, those are two other films, maybe the most famous films from the same era about masochism. And all three of these movies end with deviance being resolved in some way, right? And, and it seems like that's necessary for closure. They sort of have a happy ending where, where deviance is, is washed away. Uh, but maybe, maybe they also leave the door open a little bit to certain desires and subversive practices. Like I said, my reading hinges on, on this sort of ambivalence, on there being some true allure to Baba Yaga as her representing the artistic struggle or something, and that's something that people would want to some degree. You'll have to see. Uh, you'll have to watch the movie and see if, it, see if this makes sense um, to you. Anyway, let me leave you with two lasting details that stood out to me. First of all, I really like the clear telephone in this movie. A lot of scenes in, in the film really don't look like the 1970s. Milan is a, is a pretty old city, uh, but this clear phone is jarring. I like that we catch a glimpse of the wires inside. If I had a bit more time, I'd try to work this phone more centrally into the review. Um, finally, notice that the doll in this film is, is named Annette. Could that have something to do with the film Annette that I reviewed on this channel? Probably not, but I suspect Leos Carax has seen this movie. The doll is another piece of the film that I kind of skated over in this review. It's interesting. Anyway, that's Bobby Yaga. Um, it's a cool movie. Like I said, it is a bit of a mess, but some of these ideas are kind of groovy, um, are kind of interesting, um, incendiary, provocative in some, in some ways provoking uh, a, a somewhat progressive response, in some ways provoking a somewhat puzzling response, but that kind of comes with the territory.